Hello, 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 and welcome to this week's episode of Not D&D, which is, of course, is brought to you by EN World Live. Uh, I'm the host, Jessica, and this week we have, would it be fair to say, a veteran of the tabletop RPG industry, Rob? <laughs> Uh, so we have Rob here with us and we'll be talking about 13 Age 2nd Edition, um, which was voted as one of the most anticipated TTRPGs of 2023 on EN World. So if you do have any questions, please pop them in the chat and we'll try and answer them live. So Rob, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, this is great. Thank you for having me. So if you were, if people aren't familiar with, with you and, and what you've done in the industry, how would you introduce yourself? What, do you have a little spiel for your introductions? Like when you do panel shows and interviews? I think in the old days, I remember when I was uh, handing out business cards for jobs, I mm -hmm. used to say uh, left brain, right brain, ambidextrous, um, okay. game designer. And it was partly because I was doing both game design with mechanics and then writing. And mm -hmm. um, I think these days, uh, I it's definitely the case that I learned an incredible amount while working at Wizards of the Coast. Mm -hmm. And um, I got to like be involved in the fourth edition of D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. And I also worked an awful lot with Jonathan Tweet, um, mm -hmm. who is my design partner right you know, now on 13th Age. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. But I end up doing both role-playing games and card games and board games. Mm -hmm. and, and every once in a while, those turn into um, digital games. So mm -hmm. I'm sort of a, at this moment, I'm a gaming omnivore. And, Amazing. Uh, yeah. And so, um, but we're here to talk about tabletop role playing games, which I, which somehow entered my life at a time when they hadn't entered nearly anybody else's, and it's kind of bizarre to think about how yes. how weird that path really was back then. Well, yeah, I mean, I ask all guests what their first experience with role playing games was, and yours is is very classic back in the seventies. So if you, I think you've said it online before, but just in case people aren't familiar with your your origin story, as it were, if you're a comic book hero, tell us about yeah. your first role playing experience. I was living in Germany. My dad commanded nuclear missile bases there. Wow, huh, which was a crazy, <laughs> which was a crazy thing, so and cool. um, it was nineteen seventy two. Mm -hmm. I got a, there was a Boy's Life magazine and I ordered the catalog um, that mm -hmm. showed military soldiers on the back of it. And it was a tiny little blurb. Mm -hmm. And it turned out the catalog was from the company that um, Lowry's Hobbies that would later be involved with printing D&D. Um, so, okay. so in 1972, I started buying war games from them like Fight in the Skies, which mm -hmm. later became a TSR role-playing game called Dawn Patrol. And, okay. uh, World War One airplanes. And then in 1974, when we moved back to the United States at the end of the year, I think right, I, might, I probably got the game in 75. I think my parents let me buy mm -hmm. it like as my own Christmas present to myself or something when I was 10. Nice. And so then, you know, I get the first uh, edition of D&D &D, and that was a brown box, um, three books. And yeah. there was nobody else in the state of Kansas that I knew of who knew it or had heard of it or yeah. So in those days, I didn't know that dice existed, like never like with money shapes, you know, I had six yeah. sided dice, stuff like that. So as a as a fourth, as a fifth grader and a sixth grader, I tried to like figure out how to play. Mm -hmm. Later on I found some other games that really actually made me realize that D D must make sense in its own right. And I, mm -hmm. I went back to it and figured more out. And um, so, yeah, I was at first, there was a year, there were, there were years when I either, when I had or had played every role-playing game that existed in mm -hmm. the very early days, but you know, that changed. <laughs> uh, not the so, case today. No, not the case today. And so, <laughs> um, yeah, I got, um, I got involved in writing for a, a fanzine called Alarms and Excursions when I was in high mm -hmm. school. And that was a magazine that a lot of really successful role-playing game designers wrote for, for fun, like Lee mm -hmm. Gold. Um, she runs it out of California. And mm -hmm. there were people like Dave Hargrave, who did the Arduin Grimoire, and Greg Stafford, who um, did uh, Glorantha and RuneQuest. And actually, if you name early role-playing game writers and some of the late ones, they were mm -hmm. maybe writing for that magazine. And that's how I got to be um, friends with Robin Laws. Mm -hmm. who um, he eventually started giving me, I think he was giving me work. He said he didn't have time to finish it, but I think he was just being nice to me. Oh, and, um, <laughs> I'm sure that's not the case. 
so right about that so then uh that was more like mm -hmm. 20 years after i had originally that would be like the early 90s okay that I first got into doing pro stuff so amazing so like obviously we talked about how the the role-playing scene is different from the 90s because there were like fewer games like now there's thousands of games released every year how do you think the professional industry has changed you know between now and, and the 90s or what differences have you noticed working throughout that time i think the the first obvious big one is that gaming is more inclusive because when it mm -hmm. started off it had it, it you know it, it was an outgrowth of wargaming um, mm -hmm. The same people who've been really involved in, uh, you know, Gary Gygax was a war game designer mm -hmm. um, who was super, super busy with fanzines and everything like for war games all across America and uh, less the world. Um, but that meant that it was um, largely, largely male at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and the games, you know, there were many games that were, I would say, more friendly to computer engineers than they were to um, uh, people who wanted to like tell basically do narratives that were interesting and psychological sure. emotional dynamics mm -hmm. um, you know so the old the old school gaming at the time like right now um, first of all the market is completely different because if you can't depend on game distribution you might be able to depend on uh, kickstarting a product yourself and finding people who really love what you're doing sure. and are going to support you that way. And that's a, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a giant, giant difference. I mean, I think in my yeah. era, you know, here we were paying a little money to go ahead and publish in a fanzine, like paying for the cost of the pages printed. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, now that, that fanzine still exists. It is still mm -hmm. going, still going strong, but people have the ability to go ahead and, produce their own work and share mm -hmm. it um, far more than they did before. Sure. Um, so that's obviously the big one. I mean, that's one of the huge mm -hmm. things. So, and, uh, and, and if you look at pictures of the early gaming conventions, I mean, there were hardly mm -hmm. any women there, you know, there were some, but, yeah. and, you know, like Lee Gold, for example, was like, uh, was, but, but there were not that many um, female creators Mm -hmm. um compared to men yeah at all i definitely noticed that as well because i've been playing not i haven't been in the industry since the 90s like yourself uh have been alive that amount of time though but like when i started really getting into <laughs> when i really started getting into role-playing games you know a, a decade or so ago when i went to conventions like it's the, it's changed even over the last 10 mm -hmm. years like so much and like you say it's really great to see loads of different people playing different different games and, and telling different stories um but yeah one thing i did want to touch upon is, as you mentioned previously that you did work for kind of wizards of the coast and worked on fourth edition of of dnd do you have any fun stories from that time or and any kind of particular parts of that that you're really proud of that you'd like that i'm giving you permission to brag about right now <laughs> huh. so the fourth edition thing was like the weirdest big project i'd ever been involved in okay. because like being, and I, I will honestly say, I mean, when you're asking me for a good story and like one thing that occurs to me is that okay. I learned a heck of a lot about like, like being a leader, but partially mm -hmm. that's because of like the stumbles along the way. Okay. Um, so I, I, I loved, um, we got to, here's an example of one thing that was really fun. Like okay. um, we, the game had a, was like struggling a little bit with the way powers worked and stuff. And at some point, mm -hmm. there was a um, there was a meeting where um, the a development team was getting together to like talk about how to handle all the powers. And uh, it was fun to watch. There was a solution, which was to uh, go ahead and have at will powers and counter powers and daily powers and to call them by sort of like the uh, lights on a Christmas tree, uh, mm -hmm. either black, green, and red or red, red, green, yellow, something like that. And uh, two people with the meeting came up with the idea at the exact same time separately and okay. was able to like watch that happen as they like, as one person's <laughs> writing on the board saying the meaning for the other, other person to set it. And it was uh, Rich Baker and Mike Merles were simultaneously coming up with this idea and everybody at the table was going, oh, 
in the room was going, oh, yes, this is a wonderful and wonderful idea. And bizarrely, we'd watch two people come up with it at almost the same moment. <laughs> that was a pretty fun one. Uh, I was, I also, when D&D &D first released, I was in the Tower of London. And um, I, I had gotten flown over okay. there. And so I was, I was yeah. able to, like, I was in the Tower of London, like running a game, uh, basically helping, you know, teach everybody how to play. Mm -hmm. And it turned out years later that there were some really, really fun people there. And it turned out years later, I would work with some of them because some of them were from Pelgrain and others yeah. were, you know, uh, people who, you know, later, later entered my life. And so the weird part is everybody says, oh yeah, we were at the Tower of London. And in fact, like they're bringing out my signature on books and I'm going, what? I knew you then? <laughs> so yeah, that, that was funny. That's amazing. I love how you say so offhand. So I was running a, a game in the Tower of London, you know, as if that's something so commonplace and every day that we're all like, of course, yeah, as we do, as we do on the weekends all the time. Um, but yeah, but Pelgrim Press, as you mentioned, I'll, I'll use this as a segue because uh, they Pelgrim Press are the publishers of um, 13th Age, who you work with there. Yeah. Um, which is what we're here to talk about. And we have some people in the comments who are excited to talk about that. <laughs> I see. Uh, I so, see. <laughs> so let's get into the meat of it. If you're watching live and you have any questions, uh, please pop them in the chat. If you're listening to the podcast, we'll put links in the show notes where you can probably go and pester Rob for, for details later as well. Um, so Rob, a lot of people here are familiar with 13th Age, but in case some people watching or listening are not, could you give us a quick uh, kind of overview of the system and what 13th Age, the first edition, uh, kind of sure. is all about? Jonathan Tweed and I have been playing together since maybe 1998. Um, I got to start in his original third edition game. And, uh, and he was lead designer on third and I was lead designer on fourth. So after we both were out of Wizards and we really wanted to do something together, um, we talked about what to do, and the we we decided let's go ahead and do a um, a fantasy role playing game, and uh, you know the, the title not D and D is is there's, there's <laughs> always that twist of irony because yeah. um, the the OGL allowed us to go ahead and be able to say that at that time, yes. and yeah. Uh, yeah, hooray for that, and uh, we I I think. Honestly, I remember that when we first started out, there was some talk about doing the D and Dest of all possible D and Ds. We let go of that because okay. it wasn't the right it wasn't the right path once we were actually like really creating the game. Um, mm -hmm. So, the things that I'm really really happy about Thirteenth um, Age are mm -hmm. that it man it's it aims to go ahead and satisfy players who want to really be involved in what's interesting about battles on the table and like character mm -hmm. interactions with monsters and to be fun for the game master that way with monster mm -hmm. powers that are really interesting and unpredictable um and it also seems to work for people who are much more interested in using the role playing forum to like tell stories and uh bring mm -hmm. their characters out and uh when I talk about like the what's changed in the gaming industry, one of the big yeah. things that changed in the gaming industry is indie RPGs. Um, mm -hmm. And we borrowed and adapted certain ideas mm -hmm. that are more common in indie RPGs and put, brought them to a, a D20 rolling game. And, okay. um, you know, as for example, with 13th Age, you start off when you make a character, you're, you're, you're heroes. It's a high level game. Um, in the sense of like, it's a high fantasy game. And you mm -hmm. start off by saying, there is something unique about my character. Or mm -hmm. if it's not unique, at least, at least it's at least very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, as an example, you know, in, in the game we're running right now, one of the characters is a sentient magical staff. Of Another course. one is a <laughs> dragonic who is the last survivor of the cosmic lineage. Mm -hmm. um, another is the former high policeman of Drakenhall, which is essentially meaning he's a criminal, but he was visual about it. Um, okay. And, you know, and my character is a, a half-work dwarf troll. Um, so you, we ask players to, all those characters have something unique about them that an entire campaign could be organized around. And we're essentially sure. telling players, tell the GM something you want the campaign to be about. Um, mm -hmm. And we also, we, that's our skill system too, mm -hmm. um, because we will go ahead and instead of saying, oh, you're plus five on horse riding, we'll ask players to tell us what their character's history is. And then we will 
if whenever there's a skill check, it was, you'll ask the character, do you have any backgrounds that'll help you in this? And when the mm -hmm. player character says, oh yeah, I was, I have three points in being a sous chef in a monster restaurant. And you're like, <laughs> oh yeah, you know, I think that actually is going to be able to help you identify this, 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 uh, this weird withered corpse that you've discovered, like in this trap, maybe that will help you, you know? And so I then you get to that. add the background. Um, yeah. Characters get to, you know, so the game starts out, asking people to help contribute to the world. Um, mm -hmm. When you're making your character backgrounds and your one unique thing, there is no giant book of truth about the world. This very mm -hmm. sketchy, sketchy, we call it half designed, but here's the name of a city and here's one or two cool things about it. And the rest hopefully is up to your um, your campaign. And, uh, and it, I, I was, as an example, just of how fun this is, Okay, let me see if I can come up with something new instead of use the old. <laughs> I always do this uh, acrobat from the, the, the Diabolus Circus of Hell. Okay, mm -hmm. um, you make up a character and you tell the game master, actually, um, my character's background, and this isn't even their unique, is that they're the second mate on the third, the priestess's third lunar mission. And then the game sure, master's okay. like, oh, so all of a sudden, this fantasy world has missions to the moon run mm -hmm. by the the high holy priestess. And it's so commonplace that there have been at least three of them. And that's your character's background. And so that means that, you know, the campaign is going to be about some very interesting things that are going to come out of what that character, that player does. Um, I'm talking about the, you got me rambling. I'm talking about the story stuff. It's we not can't... rambling. It's an ah, interview. I ask good, you questions good. and I want you to talk about stuff. This is perfect. <laughs> Mechanically, the things that I think that distinguish the game that are the most fun are that we sort of knew, you know, we didn't expect to be as hugely successful. We we thought we were oh. putting out a that we no, we didn't expect what a to have surprise a game. This was we, then. <laughs> we didn't expect to have a game line. We just thought we were doing one book, mm -hmm. which kind of I screwed up when I put the monk on the cover and didn't finish the monk in time. But you know, so we had to do two books. Mm -hmm. Um so we were trying to provide a toolkit that people would be able to use for games. So we made things up that we thought, you know, any version of D&D &D or any mm -hmm. other role-playing games too might use something called the escalation die. And that is sure. that every round, you, the uh, I, where'd my giant D6 go? I have one that's about this big, but it's too far away. Um, you, it well, goes up by one. one yeah, sure. Oh my God! There yeah. you go. All right. So at the end of the <laughs> first round, it goes to one, yeah. and then it go, and then at the end of the second round, it goes to two, and the player characters add that to yeah. their attacks. And what mm -hmm. it means is our math starts the monsters out as really, really threatening, so that people feel like, oh no, this is a serious situation. That's how the monsters yeah, yeah. feel. But by mm -hmm. the time you get to the fourth and fifth round, mm -hmm. the player characters are heroes, and they're doing really, really of well. Course. And so that type of innovation was something. You no, know, we thought that other games could use it, and some have. Um, mm -hmm. it, but Thirteenth Age is kind of, it's we try to fill every page to make every page worthwhile with little ideas and things that will be entertaining and, and mechanically fun. And um, mm -hmm. so far so good. Um, and this would be the segue towards second edition. Yes, I was it. just gonna say, <laughs> yeah, let's take <laughs> I, into session. All right. Let's do well, it really naturally. So, so Rob, <laughs> that was first edition. I hear. <laughs> announced just last year uh was the 13th age second edition uh will be on its way to us and you are currently working on it now uh and as you mentioned just before the show started going through a pile of uh playtest feedback um for the game i think i, I think it was john nephew of atlas mm -hmm. games who's first taught me the the expression high class problem so uh -huh. the, the high class problem is yeah. that we've got more than 150 playtest reports and right. many of them are over 30 pages long. So I'm, right. this is on the first version of the packet of uh, the second edition. So we've okay. got an amazing amount of really good feedback and even the feedback that I think is possibly wrong or I can't use is still usually good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, it, it is also has reasons why if it can't be, if it can't be addressed in the way they're suggesting, it might mm -hmm. be able to be addressed a different way. And exactly. so um, we are presently, yeah. I'm very much in the middle of working through the feedback. Um, and uh, 
Okay, great. And some and some things have already some things have already shifted. I don't have any idea how many people who are listening. There's a there is a there's more than 800 playtest groups who who are in the wow. playtest. I okay. actually think that sev I think a certain sector of them aren't playing, but we're interested, very interested in reading what's going on. Sure. Um, yeah. And so, and then around 150 have given very, you know, playtest reports. Um, wow. Things that I can think of quickly, like, you know, well, yeah, yeah. The, the the question I was just going to ask is, Life Flourish asks, what are the big three ah. changes uh, between first and second edition of Thirteenth Age? So, and I understand like you're testing at the moment, so things are in flux. But if we yeah, what are the what are the key big differences in second uh, between sure. first edition? I'm gonna name I'm gonna name two or three as mm -hmm. as they, they they occur to me, and I'm not positive yet which is the biggest. Um, mm -hmm. There, I started the project very much because one of the things the game does it is one of the, a game that says when you rise in level, you frequently get to choose something, at least mm -hmm. a feat, possibly a spell, possibly something called a uh, possibly possibly powers maneuvers for certain classes, and um, when I there was a actually a, a British uh, Osprey publishes a um, oh yeah a miniatures game called uh, Frostgrave, and mm -hmm. when I saw the second edition of Frostgrave, Frostgrave had done something really fun, which is where it stayed completely compatible except for a page, but the author attempted to take the powers that didn't really work well and that nobody wanted to choose because that's a competitive miniatures game mm -hmm, and to make yeah. them interesting and really um second edition started with that goal um i could go through several of the classes and with the hindsight of 10 years realize that this was a D, this was a C, this was a D, this was, oh, look, the character actually has a B. You know, how wonderful for them. And so, you know, and 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 to know and talk with people and say, hey, have you ever, have you ever had a ranger who takes this? And the answer is no. You know, at which okay. point you're like, then that power and that, if it's going to be in the game and it's going to be taking um, space on the page, ideally it's going to be fun. And so the goal, my starting goal was to go ahead and make to give people more interesting choices about mm -hmm. what 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 their characters would be like, and to stop making dead ends where sure. I, we, yeah. a sucker trap, you know, take this power because it looks great. On the other hand, if you really pay attention, you'll be sorry. But you know, maybe yeah. So don't make people be forced to like role play um, to 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 role play ineffectiveness as a good thing unless they really want to <laughs> sure. so yeah anyway and, then, and honestly the weird part about it is i think an awful time a lot of times things like that aren't always fully visible because mm -hmm. players are players frequently choose things that make sense to them and mm -hmm. that means that those things which aren't that great get less play in the first place so my goal my goal, though, is to like make things uh, to to bring not every power up to the level of the strongest power because that just gets crazy, but to make everything worthwhile. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that even between like uh, I can say that between the first draft of second edition and the second draft, mm -hmm. um, uh, Jonathan has been spending time making sure that magic items actually are we, we've come up with an interesting way to say that magic items that you get early in your career can still be interesting even at epic okay. tier um okay. and and to make all the different um slots that you can get magic items and to make them all worthwhile because we had a situation where everybody would say i want a magic weapon i want some armor and the rest of the stuff i'm not sh whatever you know and we're now i think and even in the second draft compared to the first it'll be more interesting and the choices will be will be better there um mm -hmm. There are probably, there's going to be some things that look fairly different um, that are, that maybe don't, bizarrely don't make that much of a difference, but they, okay. they, they matter. And one of them is, for example, um, this is one that people who are playtesting first edition, I'm uh, sorry, who are playtesting the Second alpha edition. draft yeah. uh, haven't seen yet. Um, oh, okay. So we're probably, like, we always had the idea that, um, 
when we started out, we we called our our elves and our dwarves and our halflings races. The mm-hmm. um, second draft calls them kin and mm-hmm. everybody. And uh, it's been really, really fun to be supplying kin powers to give people a choice of what their halfling or their wood elf is like. And sure. and um, that we have a lot more of that in the Bravo draft. Um, but we always had the idea before that, like, well, you got a plus two bonus to an ability. This is very D D. Plus two mm-hmm. bonus to an ability, one ability score of chosen sure. by your class, because your class would give you a couple, and another plus two um, from your kin. And mm-hmm. at the moment, we we're just we've gone away from that. We're just basically okay. saying you can go ahead and use two plus two ability scores, and you can mm-hmm. put them anywhere you want. So that basically, we're making it so that all the various kin have a pretty good chance of like being as good at any class as you want them to be. And, um, and we don't, and, and we realize that with our standard array, like, you know, that we're providing with stats, we mm-hmm. don't actually need to, um, to have the segregation of the plus two here and the plus two there. It can okay. just be up to the players. And so. I think that, boy, this is not working very well when I wave my hands, I'm going to like stand Stay still. <laughs> Stay still a little bit more. All right. So uh, I, th- I think that that's an example of the kind of things we're doing in the second draft where we're, mm-hmm. we've been taking, this is a lot of really good feedback from people mm-hmm. and some, and a lot of it pointed in that direction. Um, and we're, we've got uh, the icon relationship rules. We got really good feedback. We're going to be, uh, I, you know, I think Sly Flourish, Mr. Mr. Shea asked, uh, Mm-hmm. Shia, Shia, probably Michael Shia. I'm going to say that. I think I'm mm-hmm. probably wrong. <laughs> uh, what can you say? Uh, you said you have better guidance around that. Yeah. So, this, so somebody has asked about the icon relationship dice and what's kind of being done differently in second uh, through to first. The one of the fun. This is. A, I'm going to say it, this is fun, but actually. I'm a sort of a perverse person. Okay. Okay. And I should, and I should never I should, and I should never well, I should never qualify what I'm about to say as quote fun. The okay. crazy thing about first edition was is mm-hmm. that although everybody, although we had icon relationship rules in it, and everybody knew that was a major part of the indie thing. If you asked mm-hmm. different tables, mm-hmm. how do you use the icon relationship rules? You could probably have asked, like I did, you know, I, I talked to um, five really people who I knew who were GMs who were really, really good at it, who like went ahead and all have been running games for years. Mm -hmm. None of them had anything like the same approach to using those icon relationship rules. Mm -hmm. Partly, and there's there's probably several reasons. Um, One of the things we're doing in this next edition is we're trying to give, we're going to be giving a default, our normal system, which mm-hmm. we think more people will find useful. Okay. And um, uh, I think it actually, resem- there was a play tester. You know, we had a version of the alpha draft that was really clever because I, and I use clever in a pejorative way here because it was <laughs> me, it was me saying, you know, having you roll 3d6 and any I dice that matched, you got that many relationship you got a relationship there. And it's like, oh, so, no, mm-hmm. actually it was the high roll. I, it was like, don't do that. We're going to go back to using the idea that you roll fives and sixes once a day. You roll your icon mm-hmm. relationships once a day. And um, if you don't roll any at all, um, Jessica, I don't know. I don't think I'm not making sense to you. you let's imagine you have three points uh-huh. with different icons, like the priestess, the emperor, the sure. diabolist. You'll roll for each of them once a day. Okay. If you don't get a five or a six with any of those dice, you mm-hmm. then get a conflicted relationship automatically okay. with some random icon. And so that the good part of what we did in the alpha draft is that everybody mm-hmm. always had at least one, but that this system will go ahead and handle that too. You're always going to have at least one icon relationship. Um, you might sometimes, depending on whether or not a GM likes the idea of getting it randomly mm-hmm. from the entire scope, you might do that, or the GM can also choose to say, no, it's going to be from the one of the ones you already have. And I think this is a sort mm-hmm. of an example of how we're trying to approach the mechanics this time around. We're going to give mechanics that we think are closer to real, mm-hmm. but we're going to give options 
in there recognizing, look, some people like this, some people like the other style. You can choose which version of this you want to go ahead and use. There That's will right. be, you know, uh, Jonathan has an alternative system that he likes mm -hmm. to use um, that so I think some other people will also like, and we'll be basically covering that um, mm -hmm. either in the appendix, probably, or in the rules. I'm not sure mm -hmm. which. And uh, there are certain rules things. I would say that uh, the second edition has been very interesting. Um, yeah. I was having trouble sort out with Jonathan, like, do we agree mm -hmm. on this? Because I don't think we do. And oh, um, mm -hmm. well, the one of the features of the original game is that uh, we argue in the text and frequently <laughs> yeah. talk about how one of us convinced the other one to do something. Sure. And um, in this particular case, with the icon relationships, for example, we may end up disagreeing, but disagreement is part of our brand. And sure. um, if we, and so when we disagree about particular things, mm -hmm. we're just being as clear as possible about what the disagreement is and what the two choices are. Um, and giving people options, sure. It, it's and it, in certain places you can give people you can give people mm -hmm. options, and it actually really helps. Um, mm -hmm. Icon relationships needed more examples than we mm -hmm. gave them in either the original book or in the first draft. And it needed more examples um, that can help beginning tables. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the strangest things, I will say this is strange for me, is that the second edition play test mm -hmm. is not just for people who played the first game. The second mm -hmm. edition play test is full of groups whose only previous experience is playing fifth edition um, or in some cases also fourth and also mm -hmm. third. Um, and the feedback we've got from them is very mm -hmm. much that we need to be a lot clearer about what's going on with icon relationships and why tables that are unaccustomed to using anything like a, um, a narrative um, a narrative contribution from players, how that will work for sure. people. I, and I uh, honestly, mm -hmm. it's it's there's possibly the case that um, there are some tables that just don't that are there are some tables playing 13th age and loving it mm -hmm. without interacting with the icon relationship rules at all sure i mean it's like i've got people i've got i don't know at least four or five play test reports back from people going you know what we just ignore them <laughs> so it doesn't matter what you do we don't care because we're going to play the game without them and you know we, we sure. got and, and then in the spirit of the the toolkit that's great you mm -hmm. know, it's like, I'm happy you're playing the game and loving it. And I, and the part of the rules that are problematic to you, you're, you're, you find are completely unnecessary. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, uh, but my mission is to go ahead and make the, make those pieces of the rules more fun for more people. Um, mm -hmm. So. Sounds like a yep. good plan. Um, so we, we're talking a bit about the differences from first edition to second edition. Yep. And some people will be brand new and jump in on second edition, which is great. Um, but a lot of people will have come from first edition to second edition. And one of the keynotes you mentioned was it's going to be backwards compatible. Um, and so somebody has asked, uh, do you have any like guidance about converting, um, you know, first edition classes to second edition, um, you know, and that sort of process? So we have questions about, you know, converting and the backwards compatibility. I think I got distracted by reading the question while you were talking about it. That's fine. Are you, Answer are the you question. Actually, yes. Are you actually are you asking Jay's question right there or or was it sort of related to that a little bit more? It was Let's sort see. of related to that and a little bit more. It was generally about being backwards compatible and guidance for converting, ah. you know, things from first edition to second edition. Okay. Second edition, for example, has the idea that when a spellcaster casts a spell, they cast it at their own level. So um, in the in the past, we were doing the D and D style thing frequently of having first at first, third, fifth, seventh, you got new spells, and those are the level of the spells. Mm -hmm. And because our game let other characters improve every level, like as you gained at sixth level, fighter would do more damage with their weapons, but a um, sixth level sorcerer or sixth level wizard really didn't. Like they mm -hmm. were still casting the fifth level spells. Mm -hmm. um, so we're you know it's an as an experiment. 
and also simplifying what it's like to build a spellcaster instead of having to track so, i have three first level spells while i'm a ninth level character no that's not so fun so we went we've gone ahead and sh we're changing it to you cast spells at your own level now the <laughs> character classes that we published before because we published some other character classes in 13 true ways don't have that feature it's not that difficult to suggest the mathematical thing that you you do to to make the conversion and and we mm -hmm. we definitely will suggest that okay. i'm not entirely positive to the extent with things that are actually hey if you're playing with this uh thing we did previously and you can't you need to know um this change like will prob like how do you inter okay how do you interpret the word vulnerable if we change the meaning of the word vulnerable mm -hmm. how are you going to use that um, sure. previously for stuff yeah. like that that absolutely belongs in the core book mm -hmm. for things that are sort of updates of books like mm -hmm. updating the classes in 13 true ways that might not like if it's just a mathematical adjustment that might not belong in in the that doesn't belong in the core book um, mm -hmm. And it it's definitely belongs on the web. It definitely, you know, going to be linked to in an appendix. It probably mm -hmm. doesn't belong in the actual book. But we do, you know, we will be providing as much guidance yeah. as we can about how to use, um, how to use the uh, things that were published under the first edition mm -hmm. while playing with the second edition rules. Perfect. I mean, my my point is, I don't want to tell people, oh, you have to buy thirteen true ways again. Um, yeah and i don't want to tell people that although all those adventures you bought before uh they don't really work anymore you know that's terrible and i i know when i say that it's like how could i say that given that that's how frequent so frequently how we actually publish things in the industry but that's mm -hmm. my feeling i don't want to yeah. do that i want to be able to say please use the earlier adventure um you know the mm -hmm. crown of axis and eyes of the stone thief should still be perfectly useful mm -hmm. I may have to provide some conversion notes yeah. to help with that. And I'm hoping that the goal is to have them not be that big. Perfect. There were a couple of things. I don't want to get too deep into the math, but I will say there were, sure. we tried some experiments in the first version, the alpha play test packet. And some of those experiments with math don't look like they worked as well as they should have for people. And therefore mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I, I suspect we're going to be simplifying things so that it looks a lot closer to what was there before so that people don't, you know, it won't be as much of a conversion shock at all. Um, and so when, when Jay asked, would be great to see the process, I suspect that any discussion of that will, will have notes about the process. I just don't know Excellent. that it belongs inside. I don't think it belongs as part of the core book yeah. precisely. Yeah. No, but so, there will be resources available so people can, can do that. And maybe your blog would be a great place if people wanted to see the behind the scenes of the uh, how mathematically that works and things like that as well. Maybe something you'd be writing about there. Um, very, very incredibly smooth, Jessica. Thank you, thank you for putting my thanks. <laughs> You're right. That is good. That that will be a great place for it. Um, All right. I'll just link that I, there. So links are in the show notes if you're listening to the podcast as well. Yeah. I think that one of the big things that um, one of the big differences uh, that Mike asked about between first mm -hmm. and second is uh, the very first. This is an interesting question still that we maybe haven't fully identified. The sure. first line of the first edition said, hey, guess what? This isn't a this isn't a book for inexperienced game masters. Mm -hmm. It is a book for inexperienced players, like the, with the, but we're not going to teach you all about role playing. And um, there were certain things we took for granted in the core in the first book. Mm -hmm. And what that kind of meant, and I, I, I'm going to like point a finger at myself and most people, you know, <laughs> uh, by taking those things for granted, it mm -hmm. took away, uh, I, I suppose I felt less requirement to be crystal clear <laughs> and provide helpful flow charts and mm -hmm. uh, guidance that would actually really, really help people. And mm -hmm. doing the alpha playtest packet has definitely revealed that we need to be, there's, there's, there's tables and there's diagrams and things mm -hmm. that we just barely made use of in the original 13th age and made no use of in the first packet. And there's going to be a lot more of that because 
it would okay. be help more helpful to have um, newcomers be able to pick it up, even if they aren't ready to run it, to read yeah. it and understand clearly what's going on. That'll yeah. be a change. Definitely. Um, we have a question as well that I think was interesting, kind of related to that. And it was about, are you interested in bringing in more kind of indie mechanics into second edition uh, and advice on kind of fail forward mechanics in general uh, for people that are used to other D20 games that don't kind of encourage it in the same way that 13th Age does? Um, we definitely will have more advice on the fail forward mechanics and mm -hmm. partially because, I mean, that was another place where we didn't, I think we just sort of waved our, we gave a couple examples. Um, in between doing 13th Age and now working on second edition, Jonathan and I did 13th Age Glorantha together. And mm -hmm. working on that book, we, I'll just, I believe we did a much, yeah. Is there anything in second edition Glorantha? Yes. <laughs> uh, and we did a better job in 13th Age Glorantha explaining the analog of the um, of icon relationships uh, of of the um, the runes in Glorantha, and mm -hmm. so I believe you know we'd sort of benefited from having done it once, and then we did it a second time, and we actually it was much clearer and with a lot more examples. Um, we need more examples, um, mm -hmm. and that's sort of like the funny thing is, it's like on the on our to do list, it's just this is just like a lot of places where examples here more examples, more examples. Um, mm -hmm. As far as specifically more indie, um, right now I'm going to say that I'm not going to promise that it's going to be more specifically indie style things in the core book because I ha we, haven't, we haven't added them yet. Um, I think that it's possible and I'm not going to make it, and I'm not going to like address whether or not like hand, the the way we'll be handling relationships, icon relation, uh, relationships mm -hmm. might just be better that way. Um, we probably, we'll, there'll be more advice about how to specifically set up your campaigns to focus on specific themes and specific ideas. And I think that's more typical that's something that I'm not going to say it's typical of indie games, but it's it, it, instead of playing with just the same one giant sandbox where everything, mm -hmm. everything is possible. Um, Jonathan in particular is really interested in campaigns that use a smaller number of icons or that mm -hmm. stay focused in a specific area. And I think that we'll be, we'll be addressing that um, okay. in a lot more detail. Um, there was a good question right there that came in while I was talking and I'm not sure. Oh, it was Glorantha uh yes any inspiration that, that came from that that's coming into second edition they were asking well the first answer is yes <laughs> good lot. excellent next question no, no yeah. i'm joking carry on yeah well mm -hmm. that might be fine because the truth yeah. is that let me think about that in Glorantha, we got to see some examples of mm -hmm. what happens when you make a certain type of mechanic really work. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that, I think one reason why there might be less direct relationship is this. Um, the Gloranthan character classes were pretty complicated um, in many cases. A couple of them aren't, but overall they're fairly complicated. And one of the things that we're, we're trying to do in this particular core book is even there's mechanics in Glorantha that, are, that just seem too complex to put in the core book of 13th age. Okay. Um, and having said that, my goal is to do another book in the near future, which has a whole bunch of character classes. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things about that book will be, they won't all be full character classes with dozens of choices. Mm -hmm. Some of them will be much more focused saying, if you want to play this character, there's probably one way to play it two at most, you know, instead of the five or six ways of, of playing to be character. And that therefore that these characters, I wouldn't call them a mini, and maybe they're a mini character, but there's something, they're totally different than the character classes that exist in 13th age right now. They're much more of an, a specific experience and they, mm -hmm. they would be pulling a, quite a bit more from the Glorantha and stuff, um, okay. perhaps, than what is in this book. 
Brilliant. Okay, so and someone mentioned as well any hints about for future games. There's uh, already one there for you. So for future books, for 13th Age Second Edition already. Um, but Rob, shall we talk about monsters? Tell me about monsters in Second Age. Uh, 13th Age Second Edition. <laughs> Not Second Age. The Second Age of 13th Age, if you will. <laughs> Overarching changes. There are, give me a second, because no I've been thinking problem. about what the, um, getting my various. Various brains together. We've had, uh, I'll pop up another question on the screen while well, you're thinking the, the, about the, the, monsters, the, about related to monsters, because they're talking about in the play test, you've got different traits for monster roles. Um, and they're asking if you would do the same for kin powers, um, you know, that aren't called oh. like early kin. So... Okay, so wait a minute, that's a fair, that's a death metal bar. That is a fairly funny jump. Mm -hmm. All right, this core book is almost certainly not the place to go ahead and really go into details about characters like the alley kin that showed up mm -hmm. in the book, Book of Ages. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if we do the book I want to do, which is a book that I call the other, I call this book further. It's a, it's a, you know, I've been told it's a terrible title by some people, but I still keep calling it. I call it Further Adventurers, which, you know, terrible okay. title. All right, fine. Anyway, that book definitely has things for people like the Alley Kin that are in um, mm -hmm. uh, Book of Ages. Um, and it definitely has things for uh, probably for characters that are in 13 True Ways. Um, mm -hmm. It's not, but... And I say this partially because <laughs> Pelgrane, I mean, look, uh, oh, Pelgrane, if you're watching this, I mean, clearly by publishing a book like Swords of the Serpentine, there's actually, in Fall of Delta Green, there's actually no mm -hmm. actual page limit for a Pelgrane book. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. I think I feel cat strangling me through the, through the computer screen. But no, there is actually a page limit. And mm -hmm. with all the things we'd like to do and could do in a core book for 13th Age, it you know, we have to like, we have to cut some things out. Now, one of the sure. weird things we've discovered, I'm going to come back to the question. We mm -hmm. have discovered bizarrely that an awful lot of our early advice, like that we, we've spent pages sometimes that turned out to be like a two paragraphs of advice about something mm -hmm. that was wrong or useless. Okay. <laughs> and it was like, it was nice of us to say that stuff, but it turns out that is really not the most important thing to say about this topic. So mm -hmm. we've actually cut out a whole bunch of pages of advice and ideas that weren't actually that mm -hmm. good. And I don't think any, and honestly, so far the playtest feedback, nobody noticed, right? Nobody's it's missed like it. Okay. No, nobody's missed it because, <laughs> they, because after reading it once, people might have thought, oh, I guess that's true. And then after they played a while, if they saw that sentence again, they thought to themselves, huh, I don't think that's right. And they were right. It wasn't, you know, so, so first of all, we do have some more space than, mm -hmm. you know, we, we aren't reprinting everything. We're not just, you know, okay, reprint you know, package the mm -hmm. old stuff and put it in. No, we're, we're rethinking and rewriting things. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, this is funny. I think I need, hold on a minute. I need a drink. <laughs> no problem. All right. So the question then, since I'm, the, the question about Alley Kin is no, you asked about monsters. Yes. Tell me about there's monsters. An, well, there's yeah. a lot more advice about how to use them. Mm -hmm. There's a recognition, you know, we made some mistakes. Like <clears throat> we made little mooks, little monsters called mooks, mm -hmm. borrowed from Feng Shui. Mm -hmm. But giving a player, giving the GM a bunch of creatures and calling them all mooks isn't really that helpful because some mooks are mm -hmm. different than other mooks. And so, sure. you know, of course, we should give mook tell mook, tell GMs what the the mooks roles are. Um, we don't actually want to change monster math that much mm -hmm. because the monster math is what's printed in adventures that from the previous, you know, from our, our earlier adventures. And we don't all of a sudden want to have a whole bunch of monsters that use completely different math. Sure. Yeah. Now the core book, uh, the core book in the same way that the core book had a bunch of um, had a bunch of character powers that maybe weren't up to grade, mm -hmm. um, 
I can actually point to a whole bunch of monsters where we forgot what the math was when we created them the first time. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Amazing. And, like, and, you know, they just, you know, it's like, why do I always feel disappointed when I use that monster? Oh, because its math was wrong, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and it's ineffective. So, well, we'll, so those creatures will be changed. There'll be a lot more nastier specials, which okay. is sort of how game masters up gun things without doing more math and having to say, I want to add a, you know, I want to do a bunch of hit point conversions and whatever. You can go ahead and make your creatures a lot deadlier and a lot and interesting mm -hmm. by going ahead and like using nastier specials. And so it's sort of like optional variants. So there'll be a lot more of those. Mm -hmm. There'll also be, I think, although we don't want to change the monster math, we are suggesting that an adventuring day is either four battles or also three battles. Mm -hmm. um, and in the past, we always oriented things towards four, but, but when you start playing with monsters um, that are thrown in you know, a higher level because they're, there's only expecting three battles, that makes a big difference. Um, mm -hmm. I actually, we, we, I think people have already seen this in the second edition, but I, I, I have to confirm that. But we mm -hmm. understand now where some of our earlier monsters were too, did too much damage with one die roll. And okay. that that is a very, very good way to kill player characters um, because critical hits that do double damage, which is what we've got. Mm -hmm. So we have some, there's, there are some conversion mm -hmm. notes that some people, I, I think actually I've heard, okay, Tim Baker, um, our friend who runs Escalation um, mm -hmm. has been killing char player characters. And one of the, in one case, I think it was a kill because he was using an older monster that actually has damage, does damage outside the parameters we would suggest. Um, and I mean, play the, the, the standard fight that, that goes on between, okay, st when I say standard fight, in the pages uh -huh. of the 13th Age, if you read 13th Age, you'll get the impression possibly that Jonathan is a hard ass. <laughs> uh, who, wants, who wants to kill player characters and right and and that i'm some type of softy okay you're just a nice person that wants people to play a nice game maybe survive get to be a hero believe in fun believe in okay, fun yeah, yeah. fun. sure and what's pretty funny to me is that now that we're here deep into the second edition mm -hmm. there are i mean jonathan obviously by making magic items more interesting mm -hmm. and actually more useful he's yeah you know, he, the other day he said something about, oh my God, if the, if the people who I ran games for in high school could see me right now, I don't think they would know who I am. <laughs> <laughs> and I, that was pretty funny. But then simultaneously, Jonathan's like, I just feel terrible when people get killed by surprise and lose their character by surprise. Maybe we should just yeah. make crits a lot more common like three or four times more common so that they just die more often. And I'm like, that's not the point. <laughs> that's not the you know, solution. That's not the point. And well, you know, I mean, he may have, he may have us something there, but I'm, I'm now teasing him when he's not here to defend himself, but oh, of I'm course, the best time to do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but so, uh, a link to that. Someone has said, so well, if the monster math is staying consistent and uh, player damage and recoveries is higher in Epic tier, should players expect Epic tier to be easier on the players? This is a very interesting question. Mm -hmm. I'm not, okay, right now, I'm not exactly positive how we're going to handle the epic tier math because I ended up, okay. uh, I'm not quite, I'm not quite liking where it is right now. Mm -hmm. um, according to the way the game worked before, mm -hmm. the epic tier characters, many of them were all were getting short change. So that the balance that people know right now um worked clearly and, and game masters like it was easy enough to make it work um and people did um so it's possible so it's possible that there's something very complex going on in the interaction um one mm -hmm. thing that i've noticed and that i that we're this is something that's going to change oh yeah he he wanted a big change to monsters here i'm pretty sure this is an example of the target is moving i think mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. In our games, we tend to use average damage after we get to adventurer tier. I'm sorry, after okay. we get to champion tier. 
Like okay. the lower level characters, I'm perfectly happy rolling three or four dice um, for damage or whatever. When you get up to rolling five and six dice, like it's too much. It slows things down. Mm -hmm. And we we have an awful lot of comments on our playtest feedback that are about, you know, this character has too many multi attacks because it takes too long to roll all the damage. And I'm thinking, oh crap, we haven't actually rolled all that damage for years. We're playing differently. Mm -hmm. We're playing totally differently than than people who are not playing on uh, like the Forge or Roll Twenty, you know, because they'll have oh. die rollers, and we're playing. Mm -hmm. And so we are no longer, you know, when roll, we would never roll 16 dice, even in our craziest time. So if that's true, we have to stop saying 16 dice, figure out the average every time, mm -hmm. you know, come on, you can do math. That's not very helpful to people. I can't right? do math. That's no, we can't. No, no, no. I can't do it's, that. It's not helpful. It's not helpful. <laughs> yeah. So, so actually the next edition, the Bravo edition will mm -hmm. almost certainly have average, average math average results mm -hmm. printed by places um to say if you probably shouldn't be rolling the dice here because it's, and in certain cases it'll say hey it'll say hey if you really want to roll a dice right this time this uh -huh. is a highly dramatic power to, to roll it on mm -hmm. whereas some other places will be saying no don't don't have the fighter <laughs> roll separate you know roll for every single one of these um roll for damage unless but if you do now there are people who just can't hear that i mean i play with people mm -hmm. no um up until a couple years ago i think mean, not right this second but i play with a play with a guy who would never ever not roll his dice he's gonna roll the dice no matter what and that's rolling we, dice is to, fun. we just all have to understand <laughs> Rolling dice is fun, and apparently so is adding up numbers one at a time. <laughs> for, yeah. some people, for some people. For some people. people. Roll and different, the, yeah. And in that particular case, I was able to, like, go ahead and look at them and go, oh, 37, you know, pretty quickly. And so that helps things move along. But mm -hmm. it's still, like, we... We, we have to be crystal clear. If you are going to be roll at Epic Tier, if you are going to be rolling all these dice every time, mm -hmm. your game will go a lot slower. If you use so. the average... Now... It's also possible there is ways to make average more interesting. Like some mm -hmm. people just don't like it. Um, I sure. personally, you know, a, a sidebar that's not appearing anymore in uh, because it appeared in first edition was mm -hmm. that I I resisted average damage. I mm -hmm. didn't want to do it. I thought that it was important to roll every single die, and I'm wrong. Or I no longer feel that way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't know which is which is which. But anyway, it's like it, it, the variance between mm -hmm. hitting, missing, critting, fumbling, and then the different results we have built in. If you like, if you roll a sixteen plus, this happens. Um, if you you know roll and uh, those or roll even or roll odd, those things make enough of a difference that um, it you know that it you can deal with average damage. Mm -hmm. But if we have a great you know for a lot. That is definitely, I, it'll be interesting to find out, like, mm -hmm. if people um, easily go along with that, or some people won't, probably. Um, well, someone in the chat has already said they're a huge fan of averages, so it speeds the game up, so so definitely, definitely the case there. Um, Rob, average, I... for, average for crits will be double. Oh, so, there we go. Uh, Charles, uh, that, and the question mark is, I, I feel like doing double is math that's simple enough that it's okay but i hope that's the truth <laughs> well i might struggle with that sometimes in honesty <laughs> but um that said rob i'm very aware of the time i feel like you could probably talk about this with me for another hour or so but i'm aware i only asked you to come on the show for an hour and um, so i'm gonna i'm gonna wrap us up here um okay. so as we mentioned before 13th age second edition is in playtest right now um if people have more questions or i didn't get to those in the chat Where's a good place for them to go to 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 engage to learn more about it? Is your blog the best place for that? Or well, the weird part is, I like I'd like to say I'm going to be writing about it more on my blog. As far as okay. a communication spot, it's not necessarily ideal. Okay. Um, the address I use for um, stuff about the playtest is Thirteenth mm -hmm. Age Playtest at mm -hmm. Gmail dot com, and people okay. can email me there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on. I mean, I'm still on Twitter mm -hmm. uh, okay. at Rob Hainso, and mm -hmm. certainly there's been some communication there. Um, I got in on a Mastodon account, and I recognize that I haven't yet, 
I haven't yet opened it because I realized that <laughs> my my skills at playing social networks are way lower than they should be. So I don't, yeah, okay. haven't been Fair there yet. Enough. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm, who knows? I may be moving there at some point. Um, haven't haven't done much there yet. But yeah, at Rob okay. Hanso gets me for sure. Um, Brilliant. Yeah. And um, we, I wanted to mention something. Mm -hmm. If people want now to sign up for the playtest, since we mm -hmm. had the first packet out in November, I'm mm -hmm. really asking people now to wait until we finish the second packet. Okay. Like, I'm happy to bring people in, um, but the, the note I'll send will say, hey, the second packet, I'll send you all the information. Okay, great. So keep an eye on the blog. And when you're ready to have new people come in, maybe you'll post it on there so people know, yeah. uh, know you're where to right. jump in. I will definitely do that. Yep. Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your wealth of knowledge about the, the industry, <laughs> uh, about games. Uh, the last question I ask everybody is if you have any recommendations for another tabletop RPG. And the rule is it can't be Dungeons and Dragons because of the name of the show. And it can't be a game that you've worked on or written because we've just spent an hour talking about 13th Age. So do you have oh. any recommendations for other games? During the pandemic, I played a lot of Aegon, uh, which mm -hmm. is John Harper's game about Greek heroes. Um, yeah. And it was fun to like have different groups um, setting out the different islands. And that was mm -hmm. a, I, I enjoyed that quite a bit. That was good. Um, there's a, my friend and uh, the developer of 13th Age named J.M. Defogey has a game called Jackals that Osprey published. Oh, cool. Which is taking advantage of JM's um, masters in, I let's call them dead Middle Eastern languages. I don't know. If, I think they're pretty much all very old. Okay. Uh, and so it's, that's the setting. And mm -hmm. um, I have not played Jackals. I've just read it. And there's a couple mm -hmm. of mechanics in there that I thought were pretty clever. And mm -hmm. I want him to run it for me. It's on your uh, to playlist. Then, on my yeah. to playlist. We all have a big part of those games. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there's another game on my to playlist, mm -hmm. which actually is sitting right here in front of me. Oh, okay. I don't know. Have you played? Let's see if I can show this. Maybe not. It comes up in no, front of you. no, it won't. No, it the, won't. the screen won't All let right. us see it. No, no, no. no. All right, dialect, a game about language okay. and how it dies. Do you do you know that one? I Build don't know that one, but it sounds interesting. As somebody who's Welsh, that concept is very interesting to me to see how languages I go and come back. I think you might so, yeah. be curious about trying this one. Several okay. Kevin Culp and Kat said at the point at the, when I got it that it was the best game they played that year, and mm -hmm. um, I'm looking at it, realizing that I'm going to play it with people who I can play it with gamers. I think, and I can play it with people who aren't gamers at all who will be, mm -hmm. you know, just sort of um, really excited to like be in both. I think it will work for both. So I'm Perfect. looking forward to that. Well, that sounds great. Thank you so much for those recommendations. And Rob, thank you so much for your time and coming on and sharing 13th Age uh, Second Edition with us. As you say, on EM World, it's voted as one of the most anticipated tabletop role-playing games of the year. So we're really excited to see how it evolves in playtesting. Um, Great. And thank you to everyone that came along and watched as well. We will be back with Not D&D &D next week. We have Dre Dragon from Possum Creek Games coming on to talk about Yuziba's Bed and Breakfast. Um, and we're here every Monday talking about different uh, tabletop RPGs that are not Dungeons and Dragons. Um, but that's all this week. Uh, so we'll say goodbye. Thank you very much. Good. Good. Bye-bye.